So again, thank you so much for the nice introduction and thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today to talk about the management of triple negative breast cancer in the metastatic setting. And I will try to focus on immunotherapy a little bit, the new antibody drug conjugates and the role of eribilin in this subgroup of patients because I think that eribilin is a, a chemotherapeutic backbone that might introduce many advantages when we treat this patient population. I would expect to have no more than 30 minutes to have enough time for discussion afterwards. These are my, my disclosures. And as we learned from the previous excellent talk, we can, we can understand clearly that the biology of triple negative breast cancer is complex. It's a very, a very, a very heterogeneous disease. And we have different subgroups that might benefit in a different way from different drugs. For the purpose of this meeting, I will not make any comments about PARP inhibitors today or anti-androgens, and I will focus on immunotherapy. That might be something interesting for the basal immune-activated uh, tumors today. Also, the anti drug conjugates, which is Azituzumab, which has been recently approved in the US. But not, uh, and last but not least, I will try to make some comments about chemotherapy, which is still the backbone when we treat these uh, patients. So let's start with this slide. So we focus on the treatment of HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. We clearly have to differentiate between endocrine positive tumors that we should think about endocrine based therapy and patients with triple negative breast cancer or resistant patients to endocrine therapy and then chemotherapy is the preferred option. This is the data we have with the classical agents, minerelvin, docetaxel, paclitaxel, or anthracyclines, with an overall response rate in the first line setting in the range of 30 to 45 percent. And this is an old line, a very old slide by Gabriel Ortoagi, ASCO 2003, but I think that this slide is still valid. What about after taxanes or anthracyclines? There is not a clear standard of care. And many of physicians prefer kexitabin as a good option because of the toxicity profile. But we should not forget that the overall response rate with kexitabin is in the range of 10 to 20% in phase two and three studies. Other agents have included classically Emcitabine, liposomal doxorubicin, mineralvin, or others. What about ixabepilone? Ixabepilone is a drug that has not been approved in Europe, but we have two randomized phase three, three, three trials, both of them in combination with CAPE against CAPE single agent. Both of them achieved an improvement in progression free survival with hazard ratios in the range of 0 0.78, 0 0.79. But it is true that the toxicity profile, at least in terms of neurotoxicity, was in the range of 23, 24%, grade three and four. Based on these toxicity profiles, this drug was not approved in Europe. So I think that the most important standard of care is in general taxanes based therapy. And here is where immunotherapy has been explored in combination with chemotherapy. And in Passion 130 was the first randomized phase three trial to be published. In brief, this trial randomized patients in the first line setting of triple negative breast cancer to receive napaclitaxel with atezolizumab or napaclitaxel plus placebo. Co-primary points included both progression free survival and overall survival. Here you can see the first of these coprimary points, progression free survival in the IPT population has a ratio of 0.80. Based on this positive data, the hierarchical model established progression free survival in the PDL1 positive population at the key other coprimary point has a ratio of 0.62 and a very highly statistical significant p value. Based on this data, Atezolizumab plus napaclitaxel in 
PDL1 positive patients was approved in many, many countries, also in Europe. This year at ESMO, Laura Emmons, Lisa Emmons and colleagues presented the final overall survival data, the other compromising point. As you can observe here, the p value 0 0.077 has a ratio 0 0.87. So with the data we have, atezolizumab did not improve survival in this group of patients. Based again on the hierarchical model, although we looked at the activity in the PDL1 positive population, with a very interesting hazard ratio and a very interesting improvement in median, pro, a, a median overall survival, we did not allow to check the p-value. So then we cannot say, unfortunately, that the tesorizumab improved overall survival, although the signal was clear. But it did progress on free survival, then the drug was approved. This is a second study that was presented this year at ESMO again, by David Miles from UK. It is a very similar study with two different issues. The first one is the chemotherapeutic backbone, paclitaxel instead of NAP paclitaxel. And the second one, the primary point was progression free survival, but in the PDL1 positive population. Unfortunately, here you have the results. NAP, sorry, paclitaxel with a tesolizumab did not improve outcomes compared with paclitaxel only. And when we look at the key secondary endpoint of overall survival, we can observe that also overall survival was not improved. So atezolizumab improves PFS with not paclitaxel, but not with paclitaxel. And this is the last randomized phase three study with checkpoint inhibitors in combination with chemotherapy today. This is the Kino 355 presented by myself, in this case, at ASCO this year. Chemotherapy and chemotherapy included napaclitaxel, paclitaxel, or carbogen with placebo or with pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor by MER. Compromise points including progress on free survival and overall survival. And here you have the results in patients with a CPS score of 10 or more, PDL1 positive. Highly Statistical significant study for this compromise point PFS. We will have the data for overall survival next year. In two weeks at ASCO, we will present the data in patients who receive a paclitaxel or NAP paclitaxel. I can guarantee that this data will be terrifically amazing. A key point is about how to measure PDL1. And there are different issues here, which is the optimal type of cell to be considered, which is the modality of scoring calculation, the cutoff value, primary antibody clones, and platforms to be used. So the key message from this slide is that we are far from know which is the optimal way to measure PDL1, which is very, very clear. But if we decide to go for atezolizumab, SP142 and Meritana platforms should be used. If we go for pembrolizumab, 2 c 3 monoclonal antibody, and DACO assay. Let's move now into the antibody drug conjugates. You all know what an antibody drug conjugate is. It's like a Trojan horse. It is a monoclonal antibody with a linker and different payloads, different chemotherapeutic payloads uh, 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 linked there. Once the antibody binds the receptor, the complex, the antibody drug conjugate and the receptor are internalized into the tumor cell, and once there, the drug is released by the linker um, uh, uh, break. So, TROP2 is a very interesting target for breast cancer, but maybe not only for breast cancer, but also for other tumor types. It is widely expressed in breast cancer, about 80, 80 to 90 percent, more or less, but it is true that it correlates with that bad prognosis in many, many tumor types. Why am I showing this slide? Because this year, again, at ESMO, Aditya Bardia from the Mass General uh, in Boston, Harvard, United States, presented the randomized phase three study with lasituzumab govitican, an antibody drug conjugate against uh, uh, TOP2, compared with physician's choice. In third line, or beyond triple negative breast cancer, primary point progression free survival. 
terrific data. Median improvement in progression for survival from 1.7 months to 5.6 months. Hazard ratio 0.41 and a p-value. Very, very interesting. Key secondary endpoints, including overall response rate, moving from 5% to 35%. And look at also the overall survival. Hazard ratio 0.48. Median 6.72, more than 12 months. This drug has been recently approved by the FDA in the US, still not in Europe. But now let's move into the chemotherapeutic setting. We said before that taxanes and anthracyclines are usually the preferred options, and taxanes are considered the backbone to explore new agents in the first line setting. But these three chemotherapeutic compounds, eribilin, itinotican, or binflurin, has, have all been explored in randomized phase three studies after taxane, anthracyclines, and even other compounds. Let's start with itinotican. Itinotican was compared against physician's choice in the Beacon study, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth line of therapy, primary endpoint, overall survival. Unfortunately, itiotican did not achieve an improvement in survival. Second of these new agents, binflurin, very similar concept, heavily pretreated binflurin against physician's choice. Again, eribulin failed to demonstrate an improvement in the primary endpoint, improvement in survival. That's why, in my opinion, eribulin is so important, because this is the only agent that after taxanes and anthracyclines have shown an improvement in survival. This is quite a new antimicrotubal agent that was explored in the embraced study. Remember the embraced patients treated with up to two, three, four, or five prior line of chemotherapies in a metastatic disease were randomized to receive eribilin or physician's choice. And physician's choice included everything. Here you have the results. So the primary point was overall survival and the overall survival was achieved. Hazard ratio 0 0.81, p-value 0 0.01, and the median move from 10.5 to 13.2 months. And we can say, is it too much? Is it too little? Well, the news here is that this is the only drug that has shown to improve survival here. I don't know if this is too much or not, but it's the only one. So that's why, in my opinion, this is so important. This is a second study in the first, second, or third line against Kate. Compromise points, overall survival, and progression free survival. Unfortunately, it did not reach the overall survival primary endpoint, nor the progression free survival. And as, and as you can see here, the curves for PFS were basically identical. However, this study has a very important pre specified subgroup analysis, with a triple negative breast cancer being one of them. And look at this data. In patients with triple negative breast cancer, has a ratio 0 0.70 for overall survival, moving from 9.4 months to more than 14 months. Based on this data, the MEA required a pooled analysis with all these both studies. And here you have the results. In triple negative breast cancer, has a ratio 0 0.74 and p value is 0 0.006. So enabling achieved an improvement in survival in super negative breast cancer patients, also in HER2 negative in general. So why? Why enabling improved survival, but not progression free survival? And I like this, this slide a lot. So here you can see two uh, examples, one of them with Kepsitavin, for example, and the other one with enabling, with a very similar progression free survival curves. And here, you can see what's happening here. So very similar progression for survival curves, but clear improvement in survival. So the question here is, are they 
producing different biological effects. Let me show you some preclinical models. What are we showing here? When we administer Eriblin after Kate or the other way around, what we can observe is that Kate after Eriblin is much more attractive. Look at this data with Paclitaxel. The green curve is Paclitaxel followed by Eriblin. The red curve is Eriblin followed by Paclitaxel. Exactly the same data with anthracyclines, much better enabling first followed by anthracyclines, or with minorelvin, much better minorelvin, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, so enabling better before than anthracyclines, but when we look at the same with minorelvin, it did not happen. So something is happening with enabling that is transforming the tumor cell, and maybe these cells might be more active with the other um, chemotherapeutic compounds. So why is it happening? Because adibulin has different mechanisms of action. Adibulin is not only a very good antimicrotubule agent that clearly suppresses the microtubule polymerization. So the point here is what's happening with the, with the alive cells that are alive after being exposed to adibulin. So when you give any drug to a tumor, okay, some of these cells will be dying, which is great, that's fantastic. But the point is, how is the behavior of the alive cells? Because if they are more aggressive, the overall survival could be even worse. Maybe if these alive cells after the enabling are different, this might explain why the survival is prolonged. So let's try to explain this, explaining also the different mechanisms of action Eribrin also has. So first, when you have an abnormal tumor vasculature, and this is something always happens, that's the, the concept of angiogenesis, a hypoxia might induce an epithelial mesenchymal transition phenotype. In other words, when we have hypoxia, the tumor cells might become more mesenchymal. And these mesenchymal features will produce metastasis in a greater way. Now, when we compare enabling versus nothing, what can we observe? That these tumors in xenograft models under enabling treatment became more uniform perfused. So as you can see on this line, the hypoxia marker, markers were decreased under enabling uh, treatment and the endothelial and perfusion markers were increased. So again, if we reduce the hypoxia, we are reducing the mesenchymal uh, uh, tumor cells. And here, what can you see? Exactly what we are saying. We are improving, increasing the epithelial markers. We are decreasing the mesenchymal markers. How does it correlate with outcomes? Let's go again to different uh, models. We can observe here that we have less migration under Eribili compared with 5FU and less invasion, again, compared with 5FU. Let's go to mice and let's administer to these mice 5-FU or eribilin. And what happened here? Look at the lungs of these mice. When we compare the control with the 5-FU, 5-FU did have less lung metastasis, but a few. When we look at the data with eribilin, the number of lung metastases were clearly lower. So maybe you are not decreasing the, the, the progression of free survival curves, but we are decreasing the aggressiveness of the tumor cells, and they will be able to metastasize in a different way, and this might improve survival. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just concluding. So uh, 
We have also some data with terrible in combination with pendulizumab, beautiful data from Sarah Tolaini from, from, from Harvard University and, and colleagues. Look at the overall response rate, 40% and 32% in the first or second third line of treatment in triple negative breast cancer, which is the overall response rate we have with terrible in only here between 12 to 20% more or less. And also we have some beautiful data with terribling in combination with pembrolizumab in ER positive metastatic breast cancer. Overall response rate in the range more or less of, 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 of 30%, 35%, with a median progression free survival of six months. It is true that we have some small randomized phase two data in the ER positive field that maybe pembrolizumab does not induce a huge improvement in progression free. So, so I'm just finishing. So if you have good drugs, you have immunotherapy here, you have antibody drug conjugates, you have enabling. When should we administer this drug? As soon as possible? Or we can delay the use? This is the cascade experience. And what can we observe? That at least for triple negative breast cancer, only 40 Seven, less than 50% of patients will receive a third line therapy. 94 of them will receive a first line setting. 65% will receive a second line, but only 47% will receive a third line or beyond. So, in my opinion, the better, the earlier. So, Evelyn, I think. Is a single agent that has demonstrated improvement in survival and is a clear backbone to optimize potential uh, uh, drugs. So these results have started serulin as the best option for second line and beyond in patients with triple negative breast cancer and metastatic disease. And that's all I wanted to share with you, my friends. Thank you so much again for the invitation. Thank you.